it's just it's dark. It's dark stuff. It's super dark. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, uh, and that's I sort of felt like okay, look, I'm sorry, but you know, if something I, I, if I know it, I'm not going to just not talk about it because it's uncomfortable to talk about. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, this you is going to kind of do the right no, thing. No, absolutely. So shall we do, just take a walk around yeah, the block? Is, is that yeah. cool? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, people are used to me. I, I do not wear a mask when I'm outside. I just refuse to do that. I wear it at the gym because all of a sudden everybody's terrified of each other. So, um, you know, if you, if you happen not to be wearing a mask because it's 75 degrees and sunny, um, and somebody walks by and, uh, you know, they, they create a wide berth. Where they might have their small kids with their masks on. And I thought, you know, where are they getting information? I mean, if you look at the CDC website, you'd know that children are at very, very, very low risk. We're much more at risk from the flu. But most of us aren't getting our information from that. We're getting our information from, I don't know, our news ticker across the screen at CNN or our news feed on Facebook or, or, or Twitter. And so people don't actually know the, the genuine risk of the coronavirus. And we're just in a full-scale panic. I mean, this is, a, this is a disaster physically. It's a disaster psychologically, socially and spiritually to be in a full-scale panic about something like this in which we're actually being taught to be terrified of each other. It's sad because um, normally neighborliness involves actually talking to your neighbors and engaging with them and yet um, in 2020 we've been taught to be terrified of our neighbors, to fear our neighbors, uh, maybe even to be to angry with them if they're not they're not wearing their masks or they're not uh, maintaining the proper distance. I mean it's a, it's a very strange thing. What are we doing to our, our children? Or forcing them to wear masks that probably don't make any difference. Uh, and for a virus, it's a very little risk to them. And we're essentially teaching them to be terrified of their neighbors, to be terrified because anyone you meet might actually be carrying a deadly virus that will kill you. I mean, who knows what the long-term psychological effects of that on children will be. I mean, this is a kind of vast planet-wide social experiment that we're running here. The reality is if you're a college student, um, being cooped up inside is really depressing. If you're a high school student, it's even more depressing. Um, I would say my family probably has fared better than absolutely anyone. We've been able to do most of what we were doing before, uh, even during the lockdown. Heck, I used the time I saved from the lockdowns to, to write a book to cry in the lockdown. So I can't really complain. I even caught COVID-19 myself. Um, my family did not, even though they've been locked down with me. And so I honestly, my passion about this isn't so much about the, the personal cost that I bore because of the lockdowns. In fact, I, I bore very little cost. It's the cost of the people that don't have access to Twitter, that are not tweeting and complaining and writing. They're people that are working on construction jobs or in Mexican restaurants or uh, in car dealerships that suddenly have their livelihoods just completely destroyed over a set of public health policies that make absolutely no sense, that had never been tested, and then even after they had been tried and failed, we're trying them again. I mean, this just makes absolutely no sense. I can't help but think that historians in the future when they're writing about 2020 will describe this time as one of the greatest public policy catastrophes of modern history. It's frustrating to live through a catastrophe like this. It would be one thing to write about it as, a, as sort of ancient history, uh, but to actually be living through it. That's, it's what's sort of odd to be able to both be experiencing it, but also try to get some critical distance to be able to abstract and to be able to analyze it. I mean, the reality is that we're still right here in the middle of it, but uh, the longer it goes on, the, the, the more infuriating it becomes, honestly, because we've got lots and lots of data available. Uh, and yet uh, we seem to be ignoring it. I feel sad when I see people wearing masks and with a sort of terror in their eyes. I mean, especially when you see people driving in their cars by themselves wearing their masks. I mean, the reality is if you actually study the, the data on masks, unless you do things exactly right and it's really clean and it's properly fitted and it's a respirator and you're changing it out frequently, it's probably not making any difference and it might even be making things worse if you're wearing a dirty mask. Um, but this idea that wearing essentially a tissue across our face is somehow going to protect us from this virus that's transmitted probably by aerosols, I mean, just scientifically, it doesn't make any sense. But psychologically and socially, I think that's, that's what's more significant, what it's actually doing to us, what it, what's it doing to our psyches, what's it doing 
what's it doing to our relationships with each other? Uh, training us essentially to fear each other. I mean, it's always been true that you might catch a virus from someone, right? It's why we respond differently during uh, the flu season. We know this, but to be trained so that we think of each other primarily as potential vectors for infection. Uh, that's socially catastrophic, I would think. Like, how, how are people supposed to, to mate, to have a partner, yep. to go on dates when, when, they're, when they're like, oh, they can't have friends. <laughs> no, you can't have friends. I mean, you, can't, you can't have kids wearing masks. Even like wear a mask. few officials in Canada said, oh, you know, if you have sex, you should have sex with a mask on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> sex with a mask on. Yeah, I don't think anybody's going to be having children, you know, in this kind of environment. Exactly. Right. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I can imagine people say, well, I mean, it's a depressing world. You know, I mean, you look at the... The statistics. Uh, I mean, even in March, uh, suicide hotlines. Some of them reported uh, three times the rate of call-ins uh, that they experienced the year before. We don't have the exact numbers on this. I mean, we've all heard the anecdotal evidence of, of suicides and deaths of despair. Um, but the early estimate was 75,000 excess deaths of despair from the lockdowns. That actually sounds low to me. I'll be really surprised uh, if it doesn't exceed 100,000. And what that means is that if you really, if you isolate the people that actually died from COVID-19, not just with it, but from it, we could have more deaths of despair in 2020 than we have actual deaths uh, from the coronavirus itself. And those deaths of despair will almost be entirely due to the lockdown policies, which isolated people and cut them off from their kind of normal social interactions. And, and how, how, is, how easy is it gonna be for people to meet, for young people like your daughter is to find a boyfriend and be happy <laughs> when, when they're told they can't even hug, yeah. e hug each other? Yeah, I mean, what it, you think about the normal life of a college student or a teenager, it's all about being with their fellow students. Um, and yet in many colleges in the United States, in fact, virtually every college in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, in fall of 2020 had to, to be remote. Now, we happened at, at my university to be able to have some freshmen in person and some of our seniors, and we're hoping to do more in the spring. But the reality is that most, uh, most colleges, certainly in the, in the Northeast, have ended up remote. So uh, students very often either didn't see each other or they saw each other on Zoom, or if they did see each other, were actually breaking the rules. And they might actually risk uh, <laughs> being expelled. I mean, can you imagine this? So you want to go on a date, you want to go on a group date, you want to go to a church with your friends, you know, you want to go to a party, uh, you might actually get expelled because you're not supposed to be together. I mean, this is, a, this is a bizarre, dystopian scenario that we've kind of eased ourselves into in 2020 so that suddenly something that would have been unthinkable in 2019 uh, is now we're told that the new normal. Well, I call it the brave new normal, and I don't think we should be trying to get used to it. I think we should be trying to return to the old normal. Like, how, how are people supposed to, to mate, to have a partner, yeah. to go on dates when, when, they're, when they're like, oh, they can't have friends? <laughs> no, you can't have friends. I mean, you, can't, you can't have kids wear, even, like, wear a masks. Even a few officials in Canada said, oh, you know, if you have sex, you should have sex with a mask on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> sex with a mask on. Yeah, I don't think anybody's going to be having children, you know, in this kind of environment. Exactly. Right. Yeah, you know, I can imagine people say, well, I mean, it's a depressing world, you know. I mean, you look at the, the statistics. I mean, even in March, uh, suicide hotlines, some of them reported uh, three times the rate of call ins. We could have more deaths of despair in 2020 than we have actual deaths uh, from the coronavirus itself. And those deaths of despair will almost be entirely due to the lockdown policies, which isolated people and cut them off from their kind of normal social interactions. You think about the normal life of a college student or a teenager, it's all about being with their fellow students. Um, and yet in many colleges in the United States, in fact, virtually every college in, in Washington, D.C., uh, in fall of 2020 had to, to be remote. Now, we happened at, at my university to be able to have some freshmen in person and some of our seniors, and we're hoping to do more in the spring. But the reality is that most, uh, most colleges, certainly in the, in the Northeast, have ended up remote. So uh, students very often either didn't see each other or they saw each other on Zoom, or if they did see each other, were actually breaking the rules. 
and they might actually risk uh, <laughs> being expelled. I mean, can you imagine this? So you want to go on a date, you want to go on a group date, you want to go to a church with your friends, you know, you want to go to a party, uh, you might actually get expelled because you're not supposed to be together. I mean, this is, a, this is a bizarre dystopian scenario that we've kind of eased ourselves into in 2020 so that suddenly something that would have been unthinkable in 2019 uh, is now we're told that the new normal. Well, I call it the brave new normal, and I don't think we should be trying to get used to it. I think we should be trying to return to the old normal. Weird phrases like new normal the, uh, that, that appeared almost immediately. I mean, there was a kind of intellectual orthodoxy that said, and if you actually look at, at news reports about this, already in March and April, there was already talk about uh, this new normal that we need to, to get used to, the so-called, uh, the great reset to the World Economic Forum. Uh, many people, uh, you know, people uh, like those at the World Economic Forum who talked about the coronavirus pandemic as a kind of opportunity to restructure reality, to restructure uh, the, the um, the, the basic structures of our, in our, of our institutions uh, so that this could sort of be an, our opportunity, right? It's, it's kind of a first run at, at reorienting the global economy. I mean, that's a terrifying thing because it's essentially saying, uh, you know, let's use a public health crisis as a pretense to increase our own political power. That's a terrifying thing. Yeah. Um, ultimately, our loyalty has got to be the truth. Um, and sometimes that means that actually the situation in which you're in might be really uncomfortable. You might actually, in a sense, feel like you have to be against the world. But you can be against the world and not be against reality itself. Because the reality is that we live in a fallen world and sometimes bad ideas uh, prosper. Sometimes you end up in a cultural situation in which destructive ideas are the most popular ideas and the most socially beneficial ideas in the short term. Um, I think it does help if you think that you have a if you have a higher purpose, if you have a calling uh, that's beyond this life and beyond the narrow situation in which you find yourself. You need to be able to draw on that. Uh, I think, to, honestly, to endure the the hostility uh, of um, those around you who uh, assume that you're crazy for challenging it. But there's no doubt in my mind. If I didn't have that perspective, I think it'd be very hard to it'd be very hard to to, to swim against the tide. Yeah, yeah. I think people got to have a lot of strength to, oh, man. to live through. I know. Well, sometimes I joke. I say, "Is it what, what is it about me? Is it that do I have it's like something not quite right? So I don't care if people hate me, you know? Because I would have friends. It's like they would, you know, wouldn't want anything, do anything that. Gosh, I'm not going to be popular if I do that. Um, yeah. And sometimes I think and maybe there's this there's a quality to, you know, being like slightly asperger or something. So it's, it's like, you don't really feel like you have to fit in. You're not going to lose sleep if you don't quite fit in. But I do think we're reaching a, yeah, we're, we're, we're nearing a time in which it's going to require us to uh, challenge these very popular, very powerful ideas. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's the kind of collusion of, I was thinking of the song, the, line from the wall by Pink Floyd, welcome to the machine this morning. For some reason, I just popped into my head, right? Welcome to the machine. I mean, here we are, welcome to this giant globalist blob uh, that involves massive um, <laughs> banks and corporations and information technologies and platforms and governments and non-government entities and even uh, billionaire philanthropists. I mean, what a weird moment in which we live. Do you sometimes feel like you roll out of bed into a different world this year? <laughs> it, there are moments in which you roll out of bed and you think, okay, wait, was this all been a sort of bad dream? Because this is not absolutely what any of us signed up for. I mean, none of us in 2019 imagined this is what was going to happen. Um, the only question is, okay, well, does this just all happen? Uh, were there people waiting for something like this to use it? Um, was it serendipitous? Uh, or is it just a lot of really dumb, public policy and public health people that uh, simply don't know what they're doing? Or is it some complicated mix of all those things? I don't know.